let's get into the, the big topic of open source. Something that we actually and say right now. This is so we awesome. We are an open culture that it is actually a big piece so of the that process yeah. that a developer or let's say... As the Kubernetes system. ecosystem really boomed... Welcome to In the Clouds. I am your host, Stu Miniman. It is March 22nd, and yes, we are live in person with a guest here in the Boston EBC in the Boston Seaport District. Um, I told my guest that when we had the studio up and running, he would be my first one here, uh, and uh, I'm happy to deliver on that. So happy to welcome to the program Peter McKay, who is the CEO of Sneak Security. Peter, Great to see you. Thanks so much for joining great us. Great to see you, Stu. Face to face. Isn't it a great feeling? Thanks oh, for having me. It, it is so nice. We were just talking about, you know, it's been about three years yes. since a lot of things shut down. Last year, I did a little bit of travel. I yeah. saw a number of events. You and I even bumped into each oh, yeah. other, yeah. Uh, at, you know, at, at an event, uh, you know, here in Boston. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's Feels nothing good, like, yes, being in person. We were having some yes. discussions about, you know, people coming back to yep. the offices, collaborating, communicating. Yep. My office but, is right down the street. Easy. Well, I walked right here. Yeah. We had a meeting like it, like the old days. So, and, yeah. and, and Peter, I, I met you through the cube. And yeah. the reason I brought you in is, I mean, you, you know, Boston, you know, so mm. I wonder if we can just start out, give people just a little bit about your background. Okay. You're, you're bona fides here in the Boston area. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Yeah, I grew up here, um, you know, went to Northeastern um, and uh, uh, really started my career, most of my career, other than maybe, uh, let's see, three years in New York and a year and a half in California, but all the rest have been in Boston. So I grew up in the tech scene. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, the the longer you're in it, the smaller the world gets in the, in the Boston area. And so that, you know, technology, super highway 128 was the was the hub when I started with companies like Data General and, and DEC way back when. And uh, prime computer PTC. Well, PTC is still here. So, sure, uh, sure. but a lot of them have been have gone away, consolidated, and and a whole new batch of companies have come up, which is great to see. Yeah, I uh, wonder. Give us a little bit of that perspective. Like, what's it like now in, in the Boston scene? As you said, you know, you've been yeah. acquired by a company of companies. You had one company acquired by IBM, another one by VMware. Uh, you know, yeah. Sneak yep. now. You know, cybersecurity. Yeah. You know, obviously a pretty hot space. We we partner with each other. Yeah. Uh, on that technology. So, what, what is what is the Boston tech scene like today? Yeah, you know, it's gone through so many phases. Like, um, you know, it's it was the hub. It's where it started, really, back in the deck days and. All the companies you know, that came out of DEC really kind of spread throughout, you know, that whole, you know, Boston, then 128, then it went to 495, then went to 128, then went back to Boston. Um, and so it became this, you know, first a feeding ground for acquisitions. A lot of companies came in and still come in and buy a lot of the tech companies in Boston because it's a great place to start businesses because of the universities that are all here. I mean, 40 some odd universities in and around Boston. And so... It was a great place to start a business. And then, you know, companies from California or New York they come in and buy them. Um, that's changing now. You're starting to see, you know, obviously biotech, fintech, uh, cyber is big in Boston. There's so many um, security companies here. So you're starting to see this really good, um, vibrant, uh, not only just early stage, but companies like HubSpot and others just being successful in building out in the Boston area and saying, look it, I want to, I don't want to be, you know, uh, a single or a double in an acquisition. I want to go public and I want to be a, a long-term differentiated, uh, successful software company. And it's great to see. You get a lot of examples and it's kind of being in here for 30 years. It's kind of makes you proud that you were part of that journey. And it's uh, it's great to see. Yeah, well, it, it's something, Peter, you know, I, I wasn't born here, but I've lived here right. ever since I got out of college. I've always been supportive uh, of this space. And yeah, good to talk about it because, right, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, New York City, they get a lot of attention, yeah. you know, Austin, some of these areas. But Boston, it's like, you know, heck, I, I'm inundated on all the social networks. Yeah. It's like, you know, DraftKings was founded yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And now we can have betting in Massachusetts, yeah. you know, founded here. So good to see and tech it, companies. And it, it, I think a part of that, if you think back and depending on when you came, I think the sense was it was the start of the, the tech uh, environment. Like this was a big part of the how tech had started. Sure. And and I think it was the, the general sense that they went to California and, and Silicon Valley built up. There was a sense that Boston was conservative, where if you want to build a, you know, you can start a company that's great in Boston, but you want to build a, 
a transformational company, a generational company, you do it out in California because they think bigger, right? And and I think that's what's changed over the years. That conservatism has has it's you know still in some of the venture community, but I think increasingly. I think the best thing that I ever did when I was building one of these companies was to bring on people outside of Boston on our board that did think big, married with some conservatism, and it kind of evolved to a, a really healthy mix of building a company. Yes, you can swing for the fences when it makes sense to swing for the fences and run a successful business and be a little bit more conservative when the market wasn't right for it. So I think it became a healthy way to build a generational company, and you're starting to see a lot of it now. Yeah, no, that, that, that that's awesome. Uh, of course, Peter, cloud has had a big change on the overall market. I mean, yeah. if we think, you know, the, the big, you know, the two biggest cloud companies, you know, they're not based in Silicon Valley, they're they're based in Seattle, but yeah. they, they are global uh, yes. at, at this point. Um, cloud obviously had a huge impact on everything we're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, especially from a security standpoint, you know, I, I think, mm. you know, if you dial back the clock, you know, 10 to 15 years ago, it's, I'm not sure if I'm going to do cloud mm. because of security. Now it's like, well, maybe I should rethink my security and yeah. cloud gives me an opportunity to rethink what I'm doing. Give us, if you could, kind of the, the, the cloud security landscape yeah. and what you're seeing there. Yeah, I think, you know, everybody, like you said, we're hesitant to go to the cloud because of, you know, the possible security risk. And, and you know, that coupled with, you know, a lot more of the cyber trends that have gone on over the years, it's just increasingly hearing more and more about, um, you know, ransomware, malware. I mean, a tremendous amount of security risk that continues. So there was a hesitancy, but then the 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 benefits, the business benefits, the agility of building apps and running them in the cloud became so so compelling that, uh, and uh, at the same time, the new breed of security companies were coming up built for the cloud and helping companies like, you know, for Sneak, helping companies who are building these applications, but want to put them in the cloud and run them there and make sure that they're secure as I'm building in the cloud and then back to, you know, in a multi-cloud environment. And so I think not only has has it become so compelling to move uh, more of that, your business to the cloud. Um, but but at a time when risks are the greatest, like uh, every every month you're seeing an uptick in, in cyber, the tech has gotten so much better, more proactive versus reactive. And I think that's made it a lot easier for companies who want to make that shift, whether it's you know slow, medium or fast, to be able to do it with minimum risk. Yeah, so for the audience, of course, please do, if you have some questions, put it in there. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on that. I've got lots of discussion uh, for, for, for Peter here, but Peter, wonder if you could tease out a little bit, you know, what you were just talking about. You know, there's always that dynamic. How much does, you know, the platform, whether that is the cloud provider or the operating system, provide a certain amount of security? versus, you know, the developer-led activity. Yeah. You know, we've seen huge growth in how important developers have been, you know, the last 10 plus years there. Uh, there there's always been a dynamic, and I know we, we've seen a lot of change yeah. in that uh, dynamic, uh, you know. Yeah, it, I, I think security was slow, uh, to be honest, when they start moving to the cloud, moving applications and workloads to the cloud, and they recognize, like, look, let's just get to the cloud, build a new app, get it to the cloud as quickly as we can. And then they're like, oops, now I got to make sure that those applications are secure and they reacted. And so, so it, it, where we came about seven years ago was look at your, you're fixing vulnerabilities in the cloud. You're, you're fixing them too late. The, your applications are already running and you're exposed. And so the concept of what we call developer security was it's do it earlier and earlier in the software, build it into the IDE, into the software, the CICD, all the way through your software development life cycle. So before you are releasing, and, and that was probably the biggest change from a waterfall approach to software development to a agile scrum sprint uh, where you're releasing software and enhancements on a daily hourly basis, you have to embed it in as you go so it doesn't slow you down. And so this concept of develop fast, but stay secure at the same time. That's really how we built our business is embedded in. And so don't expect secure developers to be security experts. 
So build in a, like a word document, like you, you build spell check, you know, you it's think of us as like spell check for a developer. As you're building, we highlight where there's a problem and you fix it along the way. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there's, you know, the buzzword out there. Yeah. So, you know, it's shift left, it's DevSec yeah. ops, you know, how much does the developer have to think about security? How much are the tools just helping them do their job? What's the relationship between the security team, yeah. uh, you know, and that developer? Yeah, that's today? a great question. Yeah. So, so it's evolved. Like, um, you know, we had all our products started as freemium, right? So developers can use it and, and they can start and they get, they become security aware. And so over the seven years, we've been helping developers become more security aware. We bought a conference, DevSecCon, which is all around teaching developers security. Um, on the other side, we had to teach security how to be dev aware, um, you know, how to embed it. You know, the days of these application security people who are at the end of the process right before everything's going to go live or in live, you know, it just didn't scale. The number of developers were taking off and this gap between developers and security, you had to find a different way. You had to shift left. All the, the empowerment of applications who used to be in a data center and used to be in IT have now kind of moved to de empowering developers to move those and run those applications in the cloud. And so they had to find a different way. And so embedding it in, not to expect developers to be the security experts, but to build in uh, the policies that security teams want to make sure that developers, before they release anything, they've made sure they've passed the threshold of, of the security severity ones, twos, and threes. And so we became this bridge between, you know, developers becoming security aware and, and security teams become developer aware. And we're the bridge between the two of them. And that's how we've been able to help these more progressive uh, digital transformational efforts of companies make sure we don't slow that process down. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I think about almost my entire career, a lot of the discussion has been, you know, how do you get out of your silo? How yeah. do you break through silos? Um, we talked about like, if people aren't going to the office, you know, you're not necessarily across the table yeah, and learning anymore. from each other. So, you know, the question sometimes is, hey, can software actually be a bridge for that? We yeah. find, you know, our Ansible product does a lot of that. Yeah, if yeah, I have a absolutely. product owner and an engineer, and if all of these people, if we're in the same tool and it can speak their individual languages, yeah. it can actually help more than just like, you know, another collaboration tool that isn't necessarily exactly. getting my job done. Yep. Everybody's trying to be more productive, more collaborative, um, more automated. Um, and so that's really what we've tried to do is just, um, and that our partnership is the same. How do we automate? How do we embed security throughout that, you know, from the from the early stages all the way through into production? Um, and, and I think that's where the more advanced companies, not everybody's there, um, but you're starting to see that dramatically change as, as, as companies are trying to go, faster and faster. And there isn't a CEO out there that isn't trying to get more productivity out of their development teams. You know, Red Hat is, Sneak is, we're all trying to get to more. But at the same token, it's got to be secure because I, I don't want to, I don't want anybody or me showing up in the Wall Street Journal with a, you know, a hack of something, some uh, vulnerability that we didn't catch. And so, you know, this is that, you know, don't slow developers down, make sure they stay productive but you got to be secure at the same time. Okay. So you mentioned kind of the freemium to paid model. Yeah. Can you help tease through the whole discussion of open source, security, how do I pay? How secure is yeah. that? It, it's a big topic. I got yeah, a few, yeah. few follow-up questions. Yeah. But. So so the way we started, and we started in 2015 with a freemium, uh, it was scanning open source for vulnerabilities. That was how we did it. We did kind of an individual a developer uh, license that developers can start use. Anybody who's building, even today, building an open source application, you get Sneak Freemium. Um, when you start wanting to collaborate in the integrations and you want to do more, then it shifts to a paid version. And for and that started two years later in 2017, we started to do the, the upselling, which was basically, you know, developers want to collaborate, they want to buy the, the free, the, the paid version. And for four years, that's all we did. It was very much like a kind of an Atlassian or some of the other, you know, dev-centric uh, solutions. And there was this bottoms up viral adoption, you know, just wow your developers to, to you know, want to, you know, want to go fast, but want to be secure at the same time. And then we followed up years later with a top down. So anybody was building, we were the best in the world at companies who are building new apps and moving them to the cloud. And so that's what we did. But over time, they said, hey, can I use that same infrastructure for my 
my old applications that I want to modernize and I want to embed that same modern architecture and, and platform. And so we had to go not only with new, we had to go with the old. And that was a big transition for us. But that's our model. It's very much of a viral bottoms up product led motion with a top down security, security budget um, kind of expansion motion. Yeah. Um, so something I've watched, you know, for the, the decades of open source is we started, you know, kind of free software yeah. slash premium, you know, again, security is one of those things. What so does open done. source give you? It gives you transparency yeah. and I can see things, but there is concern. Is that secure? You know, can it be secure? You know, you're an open source company. We're yeah. an open source company. Yeah. Um, I know what our position on it, but how do you address certain concerns out there that it was like, oh my gosh, people can see this stuff. Doesn't that leave us open for vulnerabilities? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, that's where the security comes in. You know, if you're going to use any open source library, I mean, you scan, that's what we're about. It's scanning that to make sure it's, it's, it's free of vulnerabilities. And you're, as you're building the apps and you're upgrading these licenses, these libraries as you go, you know, monitor uh, to make sure that the, any new vulnerabilities don't come in with any new upgrades along the way. And that's why it's constant. It's not a one-time scan and make sure that you're you're okay. It's this constant. And that's why we don't say, hey, it's shift left or slowly moving security checks from, you know, runtime to pre-production. It's throughout you start in the ID, start very early before, even before the ID, ID where you have, you know, this approved open source uh, libraries that you can use and you know they're clean and you can start using them. And and I think that's what's making, I, I believe now that um, you know, Steak and companies have focused a lot on it, it's made using open source a lot, a lot better and a lot more um, and that's kind of what drove our, our business, quite frankly, is people just started feeling more comfortable leveraging open source. And now they can do it in a, they can use that to go fast, but also securely. Uh, Peter, how do things like automation and artificial intelligence, you know, the latest yeah. buzz, you know, last six months has been, you know, things like the chat GPTs, foundational models yeah. uh, of the world. Yeah. How's, how's that impacting this space? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I think it's, it's going to have a significant impact over time. You know, it's still in the, I think it's in that hype cycle where it'll settle in at some point as we've been in, you know, t the tech industry for a long time. I think it's a, a massive uh, shift in the market. I think it'll happen over, over time. Um, but in, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, in the whole automation, auto remediation, um, you know, code generation of fixing of vulnerabilities. Like the, the Holy grail is, you know, you find vulnerabilities um, you, you, you know how to fix it. You generate, you know, you learn, you generate the code and you, and you auto remediate. Mm -hmm. So developers don't even have to touch it. I mean, that's ultimately where the world is, where it's going. And so that's, you know, that's leveraging our AI and ML machines that we, that we actually came through an acquisition a couple of years ago that allows us to learn and automate and auto remediate, which is the Holy Grail. If we can find and fix like a word, uh, spell check or grammar check, you know, that's what we're trying to get to. And it's not that far away. And that's where we leveraging, you know, a lot of the machine learning that's, that we're, the more volume, the more customers we have, the more that vulnerability database gets bigger and bigger because of our freemium or paid, the more that, that, uh, that AI machine learns and gets better and better over time. Yeah. Um, you know, I get lots of questions from people about like, you know, hey, from a career standpoint, yeah. where should I focus? Last few years, Peter, like my first answer is usually like, hey, if you can be in the security space, mm. you know, that's great. I've got a part of my team uh, that security mm. technical people hands on. I know hiring people with that yeah. skill set is, is super challenging. Where do you see kind of the current economic environment? You know, we know budgets yeah. are a little bit tight, yeah. but you know, I can't stop spending on security because yeah. the threats are always going to be there. So, you know, yeah. what do you say? I mean, security is still, I mean, every first off, everything's being hit by the, the macro uh, economic situation. Security is no no less. I mean, it, it's probably the maybe the least impactful because, as you said, a lot of this, uh, the security uh, strategy and approach is multi-year. And so, you know, any company of size that you know, cares about the data, cares about the uh, the workloads that they build in. I mean, those are long term projects, and so, um, so I don't see that dramatically changing. Um, 
the pace of application development continues to go. Um, and so I, I think it's still a really good spot for people to, to get into because, as I said before, this gap between, you know, there isn't a security organization in any company that isn't overloaded, that isn't overwhelmed. Yeah. You know, and, and automate, 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 but there's still a massive gap between skills and need. And so for people who are interested, and that's why if you're a developer, increasingly they're converting developers into these DevSecOps roles, where I think companies now need to take more of that technical expertise and and educate them more on the security aspects. And that's where I think that that's happening. Right. They're adding more of that, they're pulling developers out and training them on security on tools like Seek, where they can build it in to the tools that the developers use. Um, but you got to bridge that gap. I mean, there's there's three point five million open security spots today. And so that doesn't that's not going to change anytime soon. And the economic conditions are not, you know, are not going to dramatically alter that um, because the security needs continue to grow. Yeah. Do, do we need to do something at the university level? I just think here we, in Boston, are. you know. Yeah, so. we are. We're, um, you know, that's where we get in help with the curriculum. We have, a, we encourage all of our employees to go into the schools and help teach a class or two on security. Uh, they have access to our, our, our software, um, but that's where it needs to happen. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it's, um, you know, I think, graduates, you know, engineers getting out of school are much more security aware now because they're growing up in an era where it's a way of life, yeah. right? And so, you know, different than 10 or 20 years ago where, you know, security was so far, it's someone else's problem. Now it's, it's if you want to own this workload, you got to own all of the workload. And yeah. where security was centralized, now it's decentralized. It's embedded throughout the organization. And so you got to be more security aware. Yeah, no, that's such a great point. I, I, I think, you know, you know, the te my teenagers I know yeah. have at least some awareness on stuff. I know I get notes from my daughter about like, wait, is this a phishing attack? Yes. You know, in, in my answer is never click on any of that. I know that's always garbage. I mean, that's almost but, everyday <laughs> conversation yeah, now. It's um, like, but the other thing is, you know, I know at least once a quarter, I'm sending a note out to my family where it's like, hey, you got to do the iOS update yeah. here or things like that. It's um, very true. I mean, I just literally had a conversation an hour and a half ago with my sister on, Hey, I just got this. And, and I'm probably the most fished hacked person at sneak, you know, you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's, um, it's a, it's a big job. It's a big job for everybody. And um, just everybody being more security conscious is not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, so Peter, you mentioned a couple of acquisitions, you know, give give us mm. the update on, on sneak itself. Are there certain areas that are, are growing faster than others? Are there areas that might make sense for you to add uh, mm. to, to what you're doing today? Yeah, I mean, we've always, um, you know, we started with open source. Um, we built a container security solution. We built an infrastructure with code security. Um, then we started to build the inorganic muscle. In addition to building our own, we found, we found that developer security is very fragmented. The tools in and around developers and security is incredibly fragmented. That there's this opportunity to build a platform, to embed all these pieces together, best of breed standalone, but better together. And, and we have, so we have five today we added, and some of them came organically. Some of them came inorganically. Like we bought Fugue a little while ago. We bought, bought Foss ID. We bought Deep Code. These are companies that had pieces of that roadmap that we were, that allowed us to accelerate our roadmap, embed these, these components into one platform. They're not like a portfolio of like some companies have like a bunch of disparate products. This is like, an integrate tightly integrated solution. And we have five, we think six, seven, eight, nine, ten are are to come. Some we're building and some we think we can get there faster if we acquire. And so we are looking at that developer tool environment on ways that we can help kind of a North Star developer productivity. Security was the biggest piece that slowed developers down is build security you know, build in quality components and privacy components. Um, and, and we see a long like road of other pieces that you can integrate into a platform so a developer can have one view of all the things they need to fix as they're building an app instead of going to all these different tools, getting out of one, getting into another. Well, yeah, Peter, you bring up such a great point. You know, the developer tool set in general is like fragmented yeah. and crazy. 
you know, my understanding yes. from ta talking to my peers in the security industry, as I mean, the security space is as if not more yeah. fragmented there. You know, I was meeting with one of our customers recently and they're like, oh, well, we use you for a bunch of things, but I need to have some third party security yeah. tool to be able to look at your pieces and like, yeah. you know, I need overlapping tools. Yes. There's never one that's a silver bullet. So, you know, Yep. You know, there's certain areas you're like, you're never going to have a single pane of glass. It feels yep. like security is like, oh my gosh, I've talked to some very big financial companies that are like, they spend ungodly yeah. amounts of money and they're like, and we could spend even more because yeah. I could always do more from a security. There never is a boundary to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, I think, uh, in, you've been in the software world long enough, you go seven to 10 years of a great market and then you go two years, three years or whatever of a, of a tougher market. And, and what happens is, you know, you get, you know, a million companies pop up in a good market. And then, you know, when you go through a challenging market like we're in, that's where you get into this massive consolidation or rationalization of the many companies that are out there. Um, because there's way too many companies chasing after, uh, you know, the dollars that are now less yeah. than they were a year ago. And so that's why you see a lot of companies that are looking for vendor consolidation in a platform, not a bunch of these pieces that I have to pull together. And I think, I think you're going to see a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, of acquisitions happening. I think there's going to be some, a lot more consolidation that has to happen. There's just way too many companies out there um, that need to come together. It's too complex for customers. And it, we just need to make that a better uh, experience for our customers and we believe that pulling together that portfolio of those 10 products from one throat to choke and one platform is, is the approach that I think, you know, the playbook for the bad market, you know, strengthen your balance seat, consolidate your space, you know, make sure you're, you know, you continue to execute really well. Um, and I think that's what that's what the companies who will differentiate themselves in this market will yeah. do. Well, well, yeah, Peter, you bring a great point. There's been, you know, throughout time, there's usually like, where's the center of gravity where, you know, a lot of my dollars get spent? Yeah. You know, I, I remember back for, you know, many years, one of the companies you work for, VMware was the center of, you know, the data one center the there. Yes. Today, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, have yep. a lot of share of dollars and the growth of the cloud marketplace and the partnerships that they have. Yeah. I know from our standpoint, the deep partnerships, the first party and yeah. marketplace products that we have with them are some of our biggest growing Same areas here. because they can yeah. commit dollars to those and yeah. they can still get our best of breed products, yeah. you know, with that. So that's yeah, it's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have great relationships with you know, the, all the cloud providers. Um, you know, we've, we've, we re recognize, you know, four, four years ago, that to win in this market um, and to really do an uh, incredible job on, you know, satisfying our customers, making them successful is you got to integrate into the platform, into the, into the ecosystem. And our partnership with Red Hat, AWS and others have really allowed our, our, us to work better together in terms of technically, but also go to market to make that a, 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 an easier and more successful experience for our customers. And so we continue to invest in that, you know, that not everybody, but you got to pick the companies who make sense to pull together and just make that uh, an easier decisions for customers because it's complex, as you said. And so the more we can do to make that experience better, um, whether it's the, the integration, the post-sale experience or the sales experience, the pre-sale experience, um, the easier it is for our customers. And and we believe that that the shifting from the pre-digital transformation to post-digital transformation or the or that journey, it's a massive shift in spend. And so that spend is around modern dev shops, modern uh, cloud cloud native applications, uh, open source. And uh, you, I think, we're in the middle of it. And it's making sure you're partnering with the right companies to to uh, take it, you know, to to present to our customers the best experience. Yeah, uh, it, it is. It's one of those generational shifts that that, that we yeah. see here. Um, I, I guess let's let's bring it, to, you know, back to where we started, to, yeah. talking about Boston um, and you know all the universities fr from a career standpoint. What advice do you give to people uh, these days, as if they're kind of early in their career, mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking at the tech industry? Yeah, you know, I I just I was talking to we have like uh, I don't know eleven or twelve. Northeastern co-ops that are in uh, 
uh, for their their internship uh, at, at Sneak. And I, I did an AMA and asked me anything yesterday sure. for them. And they asked me this, this question. And I said, you know, I said, it's very different for you today than it was for us. When we when we get out of school, you just found the job that that a job. Right. You went to the place where then. So I started as an accountant because those were the only jobs that were out there. And so, you know, I didn't have a choice. You know, I, I they, they were paying. They hired me. I started out as an accountant. I didn't really want to be an accountant, but that was a job and they paid they paid my bills. And I eventually evolved to sales and then to become a CEO. And that's the message that I say to them is, you know, it's for you. You have so many choices. You got so many opportunities for your kids and my kids that it's harder. It's more stressful. It's like, and I just said to them, look at, you know, you're, you're not going to get it all right. You get, go directionally and it's okay to change and evolve based off of your passions, your, you know, the cultures of companies that you like, markets that you like. Um, and so just be flexible and, you know, it, it, find what you like. You'll find what you don't like, and then you'll evolve from there. Um, and 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 don't don't be afraid to take a step back in your career. Like I was, you know, four years into being an accountant, I was a controller. I was like, wow, I'm a controller. I'm like, I don't want to do this. I want to talk to people. I want to be a sales. So I started at the bottom and started my career over again. And then became a salesperson at the bottom and having like to sell. And I didn't even know how to do that. I just learned, and that's the the con of the COVID era when nobody's in. I just sat next to someone who was a really good saleswoman that I learned a ton and that's how I learned how to sell. Um, but it's like, you know, where you start is not where you, you end. And so just be flexible on that journey and, uh, you know, follow your heart. Yeah. Well, P Peter, I love that. The, the, the learning, the flexibility is so important. Uh, I had friends that used to do a podcast about careers and it's like, Nobody could just like no. goes up a ladder anymore. And no. it is very different. Um, you yes. know, almost everyone's going to have multiple careers, multiple jobs, yes. you know, industries and things change all the time. Yes. I always love, you know, I quote Clay Christensen on this oh, is, yeah. you know, strategy is not something that you put in concrete. It's something that like you have a strategy and you revisit it all constantly the time. because yes. you need to write directionally where you're going and everything like that. Yeah. So I guess final piece, give us that, you know, directionally sneak. What should we be looking for, uh, for, for your company uh, directionally over the next yeah. year? Or so? You know, I think this is a, I, I tell the, you know, the team, the, the sneak team that you know, don't waste a recession. You know, um, this is a great opportunity to make yourself better, uh, develop, you know, continue to invest in the products, continue to invest in the partnerships that we have, um, continue to be aggressive, organic and inorganic in terms of the growth um, and be better at your approach. The way you the way you sell, the way you market, the way you deliver products today are different than they were a year ago and two years ago. You can't you got to change. Um, and so I think this agility, flexibility, the, you know, if you're not changing, you're falling behind and, and more, now more than ever, I think it requires companies to be far more flexible, um, in terms of, I, I, I knew I should have turned something off in the breath, <laughs> um, to be more flexible in there and, um, in how you do things like the strategy, you've got to revisit it. It's not like you said it at the beginning of the year and just stay with it the, the rest of the way you're, you're every, every month. Every quarter, you're revisiting that and adjusting as you go because data is coming in by the day on the market, the uh, you know the inflation, in unemployment, all these things, and you got to pivot. You got to put on the gas, take off the gas, put it on the brake. Yeah, know, that's yeah, yeah. Peter, uh, three years ago, we all got a very real lesson on that. Whatever plans you had at the beginning of yeah. 2020, a few <laughs> weeks later, you tore it up, it up and completely started over. Yes. So. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Pleasure Steve. chatting with you. Awesome. Good um, to see you. Always good to catch up. Uh, best of luck. And yeah, appreciate the the, the partnership, mm -hmm. uh, meeting open source, cloud, uh, and uh, of course, sure. security. So important today. Um, I, I, I've said it sometimes. I remember the beginning of my career, I felt like security was uh, top of mind, yeah. bottom of budget. Yeah. And now it's like, to, to quote our friends at AWS, it is job zero. It is everyone's job. It yes. is there. So security, it's security, security. It's got to be embedded. Super important. Build it in from the beginning. All right. So Thanks Peter McKay, uh, Sneak Security, thank you mo so much for joining us. Um, I'm Stu Miniman. You're watching In the Clouds. And as always, thank you for joining us on your journey in the clouds. Thank you.